Welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, where we celebrate the craft of poetry. Each week, we feature interviews with incredible poets and artists, including Olivia Gatwood and A.E. Stallings, and original poetry read by the authors. I'm your host, James Moorhead, poet laureate of Dublin, California, and author of Canvas and Portraits of Red and Gray. On today's episode of the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, we're going to take you behind the scenes of an independent bookstore. As writers and poets, we have all spent many hours and dollars in bookstores. No online experience can replace walking down an aisle of bookshelves, searching for the poetry section, and being distracted by an intriguing book cover. Trisha Hubner is the co-owner of Phoenix Books in Rutland, Vermont, which opened in 2015. She grew up outside of New York City, has bachelor's degrees in English and history, and moved to Vermont more than 40 years ago. When not working, she is an avid reader and enjoys hiking, kayaking, cooking, traveling, and spending time at her cottage on Lake Champlain. To learn more about the business of bookselling and how booksellers support communities, I'm excited to talk with Trisha Huber from Phoenix Books in Rutland, Vermont. Trisha, welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Before we dive into the business of bookselling, take us on a tour of, of Rutland, Vermont. What do you love about Rutland? Uh, um, what I love about Rutland is that it's a real town. Uh, there was an article in Vermont Life magazine called Rutland is Real. R is for real. It's a working class town. Um, it was built on both the marble industry and uh, train industry. Uh, both were big there. Now the biggest employer is the hospital and GE. Um, but it's really, there are no pretensions in Rutland. The other thing I love about it is people really volunteer. So you can get as involved as you want to. And um, the people who live there just really have good hearts and good intentions and strive to make the community better. Well, what are your memories of bookstores growing up? Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> my favorite bookstore was in Mount Kisco, New York. It was called Fox and Sutherland. And uh, my dad and mom were both avid readers. We had bookcases in every room in the house. We find it highly suspect if we go into somebody's home and there are no bookcases. But anyway, um, my earliest memories, I guess, are just going there with my dad and between the vinyl records and the books, we could just spend hours in there. Um, so I've always loved bookstores. My mother also worked at a library. So <laughs> we have the whole library experience too. Yeah. And I certainly grew up around lots of books to the point where my, my parents have to uh, moderate their bookshelf over bookshelves overtaking the household and uh, and donate books periodically to keep it under in, in check. But it, yes, it is wonderful. You can go into my parents' uh, home where they're retired in the Canadian wilderness and be immersed in books. Uh, so why are bookstores, and in particular independent booksellers, so important for communities? Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> they're just such a good gathering place. They're all accepting um, what I really like about bookstores is I think it's a place anybody can feel safe and welcome. They're a great place to exchange ideas, talk things over, and talk about books, which can lead you on to any topics. I mean, one of my favorite parts of the job, because I'm actually a bookseller too, is you know matching somebody with a book for themselves or a loved one. Uh, there's nothing better than that. But, you know, being downtown is just great and being part of the community and we all know each other and it's wonderful. So what are some of the ways that Phoenix Books works with the city of Rutland? Yeah. So we've also done uh, children's story walks uh, leading up from our store to the library and back down again through all sorts of businesses, which has been fun. Obviously, we have author events, um, poetry events. We get involved with the schools. Um, when they have events, we can go on site and uh, help them with their events. Oh, you know, we donate books to the Boys and Girls Club. We get involved with Wonderfeet Kids Museum um, with some of their events. 
My manager just did an event with Rutland Parent Child Center around a book that they were promoting. So there's just so many ways to get involved. Yeah, it really is. Uh, booksellers, independent booksellers are so much more than just a retail outlet. They really are a member of the community. I think it's just, it's wonderful. Uh, so with so many books published every year and an ever-expanding back catalog of books to choose from, how on earth do you decide what to stock? I can't imagine how challenging a decision that is. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this is where I wish I could take credit for it, but my bookstore is the third one that um, my owner opened. So he has uh, his first bookstore was in Essex Junction, Vermont. His second bookstore is in Burlington, Vermont, big college town, and then our store seven years ago. Our book ordering is done out of his Essex Junction store. And uh, we have a separate children's book um, orderer and adult book orderer. They get they have reps from different publishing companies. They have catalogs. They have um, advanced reader copies. One of the one of the things working in a bookstore that it's it's bad enough that you receive in books and see them all come in and want to buy them all. You also get from the publishers advanced reader copies. So I'll get something six months before it's coming out, which is fantastic because I can read it and be ready to recommend it on publish date, which is which is great. Um, so anyway, they do the ordering, but the nice thing is um, each of our stores has their own flavor. As I said, we're more of a working class town. We can order in anything we want in our store based on what we think our customers will like. So I'm constantly reading Publishers Weekly or New York Times book reviews or that type of thing to make sure that we're getting in what I know our customers like. So that's, I hope that answers that. Yeah, no, I think that, that that's a great insights into how things work behind the scenes. And building on that question, what advice do you have for authors, particularly new authors, dreaming of seeing their book available in their local bookstore? What can authors do to make their book more attractive to a bookseller? Or put another way, what are some of the mistakes you've seen that make a book harder to sell? Uh, oh, boy, I hope this is politically correct to say this. One of the one of the things in our bookstore is that we will not we will not carry books that are solely published by Amazon. My owner feels very strongly about that. So I think my first suggestion is make sure you're publishing with somebody that your independent bookstore in your town is comfortable selling. Right. Uh, we definitely had that be an issue at all three of our stores. And it's not just our store. A lot of bookstores feel this way. Be sure that you understand the difference between us selling your books just where we order them from the publisher and sell them versus you selling on consignment. You know, either way is, is great, but there are differences between the two. Um, and make sure you're clear on what the percentage is for consignment um, and how that will will work. But I think also just stopping in, you know, people stop in all the time. And especially if you are local, I mean, we're very interested in carrying local books. So um, there's nothing wrong with putting it out there, putting your face out there, dropping off a copy of your book. That's often the way that we get local books anyway on our shelves. I think that's ter terrific and direct advice. So I think it, you weren't politically incorrect at all. I think that was it's really important information for people to know and think about because, like you said, it's not just your, not just Phoenix Books that that has some of these um, constraints or restrictions or points of view. There are others that do as well. So I think that's terrific. Yeah. So in an article I read about the opening of Phoenix Books Rutland, the model used was described as a community-supported enterprise business model. Uh, for other booksellers or folks thinking of getting into bookselling, what, what is that? How does that model work? What does it mean? What happened was there was a there was a group in Rutland that met, you know, a whole hodgepodge of different uh, business leaders, community people, and said, "What do we really want in our town?" And at the top of the list was a bookstore. So, as I said, my par my partner, Mike DeSanto, already owned two bookstores up north. Somebody approached him and said, what would it take for you to come down and open a bookstore in Rutland? And he said, well, let me tell you what I did in Burlington, Vermont. 
And what he did is he he said to the the person who approached him, Steve Costello, wonderful man, just retired. And he said, Steve, if you can get me 50 people who will um, do a pre-buy of books of $1,000 each, you've got a deal. And then he said, and if you could find a couple other investors who would just invest a sum bigger than that, um, if we could get to a certain level, then I, I will do that. And basically what, what happened is that happened. What he would basically was saying is we need a way to pre-buy some inventory. Mm-hmm. That, that needs to be the commitment. So it buys us time. It gets us to get the inventory in. And then it's really wonderful for the customer because the customer comes in and they have $1,000 on account and they can just use their account. I mean, some people blew through it quickly and some people after five, six, seven years are still using it, <laughs> put more money on. But it was, it's a really interesting model. Um, and then he said, and the way I got involved is he wanted a local manager and he wanted that manager to also be a co-owner and a part investor. So that's where he got, you know, uh, he had a couple other people, too, that gave more than a thousand. And that, you know, that was the model. And um it, it was very successful. I think that's a very a clever approach. I love I love that. And I asked that because I thought that I'm sure there are going to be other communities and cities and folks thinking of opening a bookstore that are are uh, are going to think about that model. And what are some of the things you've learned about opening uh, Phoenix Books Rutland? Things you do differently, things that worked really well. Obviously, this model has worked really well. Uh, but what would you? What advice would you give for someone who's hearing this and going, "Ah, oh, I want to make this happen." What are the? What's the learnings that you can pass along? Wow, it's a lot of work, and I mean, we were lucky that we had the expertise from our our um, mothership <laughs> store in Essex. Just there's so many things to think about, not just pictures and books and that type of thing. Bookstores cannot survive, in my opinion, if they aren't also a gift store. And I know that bothers some people, but it's the reality. So a third of our store is actually children's, which includes, you know, toys, games, puzzles, plush, um, et cetera. Bookstores have to do that in order to survive. So keep in mind that you probably are not just going to be selling books. That's a big piece of it. And then the other thing I think is is knowing your community. I mean, certainly when we opened up, <laughs> we, we thought we knew what the community wanted. Sometimes we were right and sometimes we weren't in terms of what would sell. And that, you know, honestly, that saved us during COVID <laughs> because... We had the perfect business for COVID. I'm probably jumping ahead. Sorry. But, you know, people were stuck in their homes. And what did they want? Yeah, they wanted books for sure. But they also wanted puzzles and games and puzzle books and jigsaw puzzles, you know, um, which was great. And we could run it out to the curbside. And there you go. Oh, that, that that's an interesting insight. Is that in addition to being just fundamental the business model, it, it helped you weather the COVID storm, which you uh, you you got through to the other side. And yeah, maybe that is uh, that is another question I had uh, was about COVID. What are the things you did to to get through COVID? And maybe so that it's not just about a two year period that hopefully in our lifetimes isn't repeated in exactly the same way. What are the things that you're doing differently now because of that experience getting through COVID? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there were times when it first started where we would only have one person in the store. We, we, our store is small enough. It's usually just two people. But we did that for safety reasons. But we could do that, which is great, and did curbside pickup. Um, the other thing that we uh, – and then people could also pay over the phone. There didn't have to be any any customer contact. The other thing that we started that we've continued is delivery, free delivery in Rutland. I, me, and my manager do that, <laughs> and my husband, you know, whoever. <laughs> and um, it's great because you might not think it's that big a deal, but there are a lot of people who, you know, still can't leave their homes, don't feel comfortable coming in without a mask. And it was great. We would just stop by, toot on our way home, put it in their mailbox, and, you know, they had their book, puzzle, whatever it was. So those were two things for sure. We are. We still have a masking policy in our store for staff, not for people coming in, just because 
we get a lot of children in the store and feel strongly about it. But I would say delivery and and, uh, the curbside were the two biggest things. So describe, and this is going to be, I think the answer will be there is no typical day, but describe some of the things that that make up a typical day in the the joys and the challenges of managing a bookstore. (laughs) Well, the other thing, and I I guess I could say this because I would say it if I was interviewing somebody, a lot of people think if you, you know, work in a bookstore, you sit around and read books all day. You know, first of all, you don't sit. <laughs> so you have an eight hour shift where you 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 don't sit. So, you know, UPS, FedEx come bring you big, big stacks of books, hopefully boxes of books. And you open them and you receive them in off purchase orders and invoices. And then you have to shelf them all. Um, so that's a big, big part of the day. You break down the boxes. You have people come in who say, I was here last week and over on that table, there was a book with a green cover and it looked really good, but I can't remember anything about it. We love that. We love that kind of challenge. People coming in and asking for something for their nine-year-old grandson who really likes dragons or somebody coming in and looking for um, a birthday present for their father and he really likes history. So a lot of it is kind of, um, you know, solving a mystery, right? Um, And then you have people phoning, calling in and ordering over the phone. You have internet orders that come in, you know, but it's, it's a very, it can be a very physical job, which I don't think I really realized that. Yeah. And a very, uh, and there's more going on than people expect. It certainly doesn't sound boring. Oh no. No, I mean, there are quiet days. Don't get me wrong, but no, most of the, you can always, you know, rearrange things, alphabetize shelves, cleaning, dusting, you know, all that. So it, there are some slow times, but not a, not a ton. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a librarian element to it where you're, you're consultants about the books that you're selling. It's not just the, the mechanics of selling them. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that, to me, that's so important. And that's why you hope and pray that your staff um, are are all avid readers, which of course they are. They wouldn't be working in a bookstore. But you know, you you have to be reading things so you can make recommendations. But back to that advanced reader copy, you want to be able to tell somebody on day one, not just I read the review in the New York Times book review, but I read it. <laughs> you know, it was great. <laughs> Physical books, unlike music and movies which are both mostly digital now, are still going strong. What is it about the physical form of a book that has been so resilient to going all digital? Ah, That's a good question. And yeah, I I, um, wonder that too. It's funny, my daughter's 30 and even her generation, they still like vinyl. They still like real books. Why? I don't know if it's a nostalgia thing. Um, But I do think... I, I have a lot of friends in my book group who read only on Kindles. I personally don't like it, but it's also hard. One of the things with a physical book is it's a great gift and you can't, you can gift a Kindle book to somebody, but it's not really the same. Um, and then my generation who has grandchildren, they want the physical book. So children's books also are, are real important that way. I don't know. I, I do, I do, have my Kindle readers tell me they're great because you can, you know, um, automatically look up the meaning of a word. They're not so great, though, because you're not really sure all the time how far into the book are you. Um, the Kindle books don't come with some of the appendices, you know, the maps in the front or the photos. I'm a purist, right? <laughs> well, especially as a, as a poet, um, nothing beats poetry in physical form or performed. Uh, I just find uh, the electronic representation of poetry uh, can re- can diminish the experience, particularly if the formatting is in any way affected, which is so critical. So uh, yeah, I'm more of a, I, I read some things digitally, but I definitely am more in the physical book camp. I just like the feel, the smell, and the, the uh, and the fact that the printed book is at a really high DPI and is, is just looks better. So um, yes, I think that's why. Yeah, there's many reasons why books books are holding on, going on strong. So, what are your plans for the upcoming year or years? What has you most excited about 
the evolution of uh, Phoenix Books? Yeah, well, first of all, I will say um, through and after COVID, we've had our most our best years sales wise, which is just crazy but true. I guess looking forward to definitely looking forward to in store author events again. You know, we had all of these remote author events and there's pros and cons. I mean, I've got to say it was nice to be sitting home in my jammies, eating my dinner, you know, and and watching an author and not trudging out into the snow or whatever. But you just don't get the same feel. And the authors really missed it. Um, They really missed that contact. So definitely looking forward to author events, more author events. And also, I think what we want to do is be more creative with that, with off-site author events. You know, we collaborate with the library, et cetera. We have a beautiful theater called the Paramount Theater just a few doors down from us. Um, We actually did have, during COVID, we had David Sedaris there. And, oh, my God, that was so much fun. Um, So I think we'd like to partner more with Paramount Theater um, in getting, you know, bigger venues uh, for our authors. So, and then the other thing that we're working on is working more with schools. Uh, Schools really love supporting independent bookstores um, and are very interested into different ways of doing book fairs. So that's something that we're working on. Terrific. And then finally, uh, what do you, what do you enjoy reading in general? And do you have any books you're reading now that you'd like to recommend or have recently read it, read that you want to recommend? Uh, I'm going to recommend one to you because this is a, has to do with poetry, but I just finished a book. I love, uh, first of all, I love all genres. Well, not all genres. I love mystery, historical fiction, fiction, and history. But I just read a book that's actually a young adult book, which I can't believe, but it's called African Town. And it's done in a prose way, which I didn't even know, because even though we just talked about physical books, I was listening to this book. It is lyrical. It's 14 characters. It's uh, the last slave ship to come over from Africa to Mobile, Alabama. So the voices are, you know, the ship owner, the plantation owner, the Africans. Um, The ship itself is a voice, Clotilde, which is really cool. And then their arrival over and realizing they're enslaved. And it, it, it actually ends in the early 1900s, but Africa town actually still exists to this day. It's all based on historical um, records, journals. These are real people. It was fascinating. So if you're a poet, I hate to say it because I'm a bookstore, but if you could listen to African town, it is really lyrical. Oh, it's a great suggestion. And I just interviewed on this podcast, uh, Safia El Hilo, who has a new book out and, uh, she has a young adult book written in verse as well. She's a poet and wrote a book in verse. Uh, Home is not a country. Uh, I just yep. highly recommend. Beautiful, amazing book, and her new book is tremendous as well. So yes, I will take that. Uh, I will take that advice and put that on my list. Oh, it's just just beautiful. Really wonderful book. Well, Tricia, thank you so much for sharing the Phoenix Books Rutland story with the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast today. Thanks, James. I really enjoyed it. Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast is written and produced by James Moorhead. You can follow me on Twitter at Dublin Ranch, subscribe to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, and follow us on viewlesswings.com or on Instagram at Viewless Wing.